Hello, and welcome to another Progressives for Immigration Reform podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Lin, and today I am going to be joining, this is a really special guest, uh, Michael Yan. Michael Yan is a foreign correspondent. He's covered many wars and areas and conflicts such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Thailand, Hong Kong, and the Chinese Communist Party information war that they've been waging easily for the last 30, 40 years against us. Uh, he, Michael is so in the action. Uh, last year, last February, uh, in Hong Kong, denied his re-entry and deported him to Thailand. Uh, Michael has since returned to the United States, although he kind of bounced in and out a lot. Uh, and he's now covering our out of control southern border. And Michael is coming to us live from Brownsville, Texas. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yep, I'm in Brownsville now. This has started off as an interesting year. I was at the January 6th Capitol attack, which I think you're familiar with. <laughs> mm. And then, uh, and, uh, and then I was at the inauguration, if you wanted to call it that. They sure built a lot of wall quickly for that. And then right after oh, the inauguration, right. when yeah. it's when it's about protecting the elites and not right. the wage earning and productive classes, yeah, that they'll build the wall. Right. Yeah. I mean, Washington D.C. was basically a ghost town, and uh, except for the soldiers and the and the law enforcement, which were filling all the, uh, I was staying at the Capitol Hilton, but they were filling up that hotel and so many more. And, uh, and then right after inauguration, within about 24 hours, I flew to El Paso and mm. immediately right after inauguration, the border, they started hitting the border. The migrants were coming across the border. And Cause, customs cause and border Michael, if I can interrupt for just to help orient our guests, you have for, for over a year easily and probably longer have been really covering these migrations, uh, whether they're in Africa, Europe, uh, Central, uh, South America, our border to the South. And that's why I'm so excited to get your perspective. So I just want to let our audience know that's the level of, that's, that's the expert we have here today. Someone who has not just been like gathering in data, has been out there in the field and can speak anecdotally as to what's going on. So please go ahead, Michael. Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, yeah, I can fill your ears with stories. I've spent uh, all this year in, in Africa, South America, Europe, uh, specifically mostly Lithuania and Greece and Bulgaria, uh, Morocco over in Africa, uh, and then in South America, uh, Colombia, uh, tracking migrants. All this was tracking migrants, by the way. Panama spent months out in the Darien Gap. You see the Darien Gap in the news now. That was Chuck Holton and I and Masako Ganaha from Japan who were who were actually breaking that earlier this year that, it, that you know, so many people were coming back in uh, February and March, we were starting to report that. And, uh, and then uh, took a couple of congressmen down into the Daring Gap, Burgess Owens and, uh, and also uh, Tom Tiffany took them down into the Daring. There's the Daring Gap over there to right, the right. So that's the Daring, Na Daring National Park. Okay, so you were, you, you're just like just north of Medellin cartel territory. Oh, it's game on out there, brother. It's uh, it's no joke. And so we we started on the Colombia side, and flew in flew into Cartagena, and from Cartagena uh, drove uh, had a meeting with a senator, uh, I mean a Colombian senator, uh, and uh, and then drove over to uh, Nicocli, which is over near Panama there up mm -hmm. on the northern side. And Nicocli is where many of the migrants get on boats. Like for instance, now there's a huge number of migrants. Nobody knows how many, it could be 15,000 or so. Uh, that, that number is a, a, a rough estimate in Nicocli. So they'll go and there's not enough boats to get them across that water that you see on the north there of Columbia near Panama. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and so, yeah, right, right there. And so I took a boat there and went with uh, Masako Ganaha from Japan and also Chuck Colton, the famous uh, American war correspondent, former ranger actually who lives in Panama and who parachuted into Panama during that invasion. So Chuck yeah. speaks Spanish I fluently. Actually, said, I missed those festivities. I was on my way to Panama and I was told that I didn't speak Spanish. And I'm like, look, I'm here at Fort Huachuca. Give me a month, I'll learn. <laughs> Don't leave me out. <laughs> you should be like, yo, I'm blind, Spaniel. What do you mean? 
<laughs> and uh, they probably would. You'd be like, yeah, I, I Deutsch. And they'd be like, okay, you speak Spanish. Right. But <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, branch goes to me because, you know, I was an Intel officer. So he yeah. goes, but I got a plum for you. I said, what's the plum? And he goes, shape Belgium. I'm like, uh, well, what nice. else? He goes, Fort <laughs> Riley, Kansas. I'm like, shape Belgium. Here I go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah here I go. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, uh, that's funny. You know how the, how the military is. They don't care what language you speak. You speak a foreign language? Sure. Spanish. Okay. You can go to Afghanistan. You know, <laughs> speak a foreign language? Sure. Arabic. Okay. You can go to Panama. You know, it's, it's how, anyway, whatever. But, but I went to DLI as well, by the way, with the Defense Language Institute for German. But the, oh, okay. so anyway, so, so we went through, uh, we went up to the Darien Gap on the Colombian side, but did not cross into Panama that way. We went back to the airport in, uh, in Cartagena and flew over to Panama City and then drove back down into the gap. You can see it's pretty far down there. They call it right. the gap because there's, there's more than 60 miles of no just jungle and it's really intense jungle and uh it's not you know there's there's jungle and then there's super jungle this is super jungle and insofar as uh i mean it's really rough out there but mm -hmm. probably about 10 percent of the migrants coming through actually die um you see you can see reports last week or so about 50 died but that's that's ridiculous it's a lot more than that i assure you and and so the, they when they cross the into the darien gap they go up on that north side there, you see by the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, go down, go back down by Colombia, right there, right there. Okay, so that's right where they cross. Right. That's where they cross. Yeah, that's where they cross into, and then they cross the border there, near, not far from the water, and then they turn it. Yeah, right there, and then they kind of turn down that river called the Turquesa River. You have to go over three mountains, and and on that third mountain, a lot of them die, and and then uh, we we go up that river. There's called Rio Turquesa but you mm -hmm. can probably see on that map at, at about this point at that resolution. And, and it takes about, you, you drive out there for about an hour and a four wheel drive. And then you get on the, then you get on the um, dugout canoes and you go up with the Indians and Barat Indians for about three hours up river. And, you know, it's like apocalypse now stuff. I mean, uh, and you know, there's just, it's just, there's no, uh, you know, cell coverage or anything like that. You're just way out there in the jungle. And the Embora Indians who take us out there, I mean, they text me all the time. We, those are the ones who are actually out there on horseback robbing and killing migrants. And so quite so what, literally. I have to ask, what, how did you form a relationship with these, uh, with, with, the, with the names there? I did it the way I learned in Special Forces, which was always to go to Christians in Action, missionaries. It was actually a CIA guy, a senior guy told me when I was very young, he's like, always go to the. CIA, Christians in Action, the missionaries, and, uh, and the SF guy, older SF guys would say, that too. so every country I go to, I'm like, okay, where's the missionaries? They always know what's going on. A lot of them are born there. They speak the language. They know everybody's children. They know everybody. And so I contacted one missionary that, who lives in Louisiana. She's like, oh, yeah, I'll come down. And, you know, she's a real nice Southern lady named Diane Edrington. She flies down. We go out in the jungle. She's like, I've been coming down here 20 years. And all the Indians know her, you know, every, mm -hmm. every Indian, every village. We were uh, we were in about 20 different villages with her. I went to about more than a dozen, I would say. And then on my own, I went to some other villages. And so, uh, yeah, so the, the missionaries are very helpful. I just tell them what I'm doing. And then they're like, OK, you know, I can help you. And, you know, and uh, they get me out, introduce me to the Indians and then the Embra Indians. Uh, Embara is spelled E M B E R A Embara. They mm -hmm. they they bathe in the rivers. Uh, they most of them live next to the rivers. Not all of them, but most of them do. And you know they hunt with poison darts. When they need to make a phone call, they take their phone and they climb up trees and stuff. I mean, real trees, yeah. not 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 these little Florida scrub brush trees. I'm talking jungle trees so high you could practically off a parachute you know if you fall out and i mean they really go up there and make phone calls and that sort of thing and uh so i mean i got along great with them at one point you know i've been out there for quite a while they're like you're like imbada indian you know because i'll eat anything they eat i'm like you're okay. like my grandparents oh you know you're I'm, I'm used to this stuff and so uh, and so the imbada indians are the ones who when the 
migrants go through, they go through their villages, right? And so finally they come to a village called Bajo Chiquito. And that's the village that if you, you know, spend enough time, it'll take you, you know, a, a solid day from Panama City to finally get out to that village. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then, and of course, you'll have to have, get permission to go out there as well, which is what I got from, you know, the Indians and the Cinefront, which was the Panamanian border police. So, you know, I've been out there, uh, what, four times. I've tried six, uh, two failed, and the other four succeeded. And, uh, and, and took two congressmen out there, Tom Tiffany, Burgess Owens, and mm. took some others out there. And, and actually, I was pretty, uh, you know, proud of them. Actually, they went out there with no security, and that was pretty gutsy of them. Oh, and uh, who, who was, and, uh, let's go back to uh, the late 70s with Jim Jones. I mean, what, what triggered the, uh, the, the, our interest in what was going on there was a, a congressman had gone down to investigate, and they killed him at an right. air, a small airstrip there. So they they, yeah. they risk they, they are risking it is risky to do these things. It was actually risky, yeah. And uh, but they did it, and mm -hmm. and they saw and they got information that just nobody is seeing with their own eyes, except for a very very few people. And uh, and since I had been going out there quite a lot, you know, the Indians already knew me and that sort of thing, so it was no problem. And uh, and I get along with the Indians quite well, so we took them down there and. And then uh, I took them back to Panama City and they went back to the United States and testified at Congress and all that. And so that was, you know, helpful. Uh, that was earlier this year. And mm -hmm. then uh, and then we flew up to um, Tapachula, which is in southern Mexico. Uh, we, we left from Panama and went to Mexico up there at Tapachula, right there at the bottom of Mexico. It's the southernmost city in Mexico. Down, down, down. Still uh -huh. down. Oh. Oh, oh, that's uh, Nicaragua there. Okay. Yeah, I'm still, uh, and so, okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and um, and uh, there you go. There you go. So right there at the red and uh, went up there because that's sort of like the El Paso of Texas, uh, of Mexico. But it's that's the southernmost city in Mexico. And that's where the that's where the migrants cross from. So basically, you have all these migrants come from Haiti and Cuba and all over Africa, and also many Indians and Bangladeshis, Nepalese, a very, very few Chinese and some others. And, and they go through South America because they can get to Suriname, Brazil, and Ecuador without, without visas, right? So you just mm. show up with your passport and you can get visa on arrival. So many of the Haitians and the Cubans will go to Suriname or Brazil or Ecuador first, as do the other ones. And then they'll and feed then, up to Colombia. And then it becomes an overland trip to get to Mexico then. That's right. That's right. And then so once you get to Mexico, if you survive the Darien Gap, good luck to you on that, because probably about one in 10 die. Uh, mm. Chuck thinks it's a little more than that. But if you mm. see the reports in the news, it doesn't it doesn't actually gather because the newsmakers aren't going out there very often. They're like they certainly don't spend as much time out there as we have. And, and so they don't have a, a real feel for it. They only know what people tell them. Right. But right. in reality, the death toll is clearly much higher. And so the so anyway, they end up going through Panama. They're finally there's there's an agreement with Costa Rica called controlled flow. And what they'll do is uh, the Panamanians will take them and put them in one of three uh, camps and they'll keep them for some period of time. And then they go. You can see down at Panama there. Then they'll go up to Costa Rica and then they'll go to Nicaragua and then they go up to uh, uh, Honduras and Guatemala. And finally, they go to uh, Tapachula. So, and then in Tapachula, as they start to go north from Tapachula, there, there might be about 85,000 down there right now. I'm unclear, but in that vicinity, I believe there's about 85,000, if my current That's intelligence is accurate. Operation. I mean, the legit. Oh, it's big time. Move. Big time. Big time. Uh, can, big money. Do you, have, do you have any insight? I mean, that requires some organization. Uh, it does. It does. Money. Yeah. Uh, resources logistics any idea who's behind this yes some of it's just of their own power i mean m many of the people are they're just you know they they'll for instance so uh, many of the haitians have worked in chile for years and then as soon as biden mm -hmm. became president they left chile and boom went north right and and then they tell us this right this isn't things we get from the newspaper this is what we get from their mouths and they have chilean uh ID cards and things like that. They'll show you. Mm. And so, um, and so 
many of them start with money that they earned in a place like Brazil or Chile, right? Or they had, or they had money in, in Haiti. And so then the Western Union money to themselves or do things like that, MoneyGram as well. They use Western Union and MoneyGram a lot. So they'll send themselves money because they know they're going to get robbed many times. Many of them get raped and many are killed actually. And, mm. But they'll keep resupplying themselves with money. Like, mm. for instance, by sending their themselves money so that they know that they'll be able to just hit a Western Union and top up. Uh, now, then you've got a bunch of groups that you see in different parts of the world, like NRC, the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, IOM or OIM, depending on which language you sit, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about the uh, Organization of Immigration and Migration. Those those are in Panama. Uh, and, These are the, uh, in, the uh, volunteer agencies that are involved with refugees correct volunteer but you can see they got some money i mean they've clearly got oh, some money uh, you can I'll look online you, yeah for instance uh there are more than dozen of these agencies in the u.s and one of them church world services uh 55 percent of their budget comes from taxpayers and that's over 41 million a year that and they get paid per head so they actually lobby Congress to bring in more refugees. I mean, it, it's, it's insane. They're using American taxpayer money to take jobs from American taxpayers. Yeah. And it's time for Americans to, if you, if you don't want to be, over, this is the weaponization of migration. I study this around the world. Just this year, I've been in Morocco studying it with Chuck Holton, Greece, <laughs> Bulgaria, Lithuania, Colombia, Mexico. Now I'm here in Texas. New Mexico. I mean, this is, I see this all over the place. I've seen it in Thailand and Myanmar and Laos. It's the same story everywhere. The weaponization of migration. Uh, and, 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 and like, for instance, between Belarus and Lithuania, or I could go, that could be a tangent for an hour. But I mean, but the bottom line is the migrants are being used as a weapon. And they know that if they come across without guns, that they will, they have a very serious chance of getting in and getting free stuff. For instance, your job. And uh, and not it's uh, and it's really about apportionment because once they get these uh, larger populations and whether it's California or whatever uh, during the census this will affect how many seats in Congress uh, the, the, the Democrats get or whoever brings them in which is the Democrats right and so uh, th this is all about just flooding the United States with people from afar and then they're supplying them with phones and with those phones you can program the people just like they program americans using social media and whatnot they can they can tell them where to go they can giving yeah. them phones on their way north is what you're saying uh no but they i'm not saying that they're giving them phones like obama phones but they can use for instance they information is shared on the phones for instance you'll see that the haitians have their own uh haitian whatsapp channels right and right. the cubans have their own whatsapp channels and they, so they you generally use WhatsApp, actually. Uh, and each group tends, tends to watch, like the Bangladeshis, they have their own channels. But these are channels that, you, that they will send out information about go here, go there. And, and they share information about go to this place or pull back from the border and go to this other place. Uh, and so when you talk with the Haitians and whatnot down there, uh, you know, they'll tell you. I mean, you know, when they see you down there, they'll like they'll tell you everything. They'll be telling you how they lost their shoes in the jungle. And you see children coming through that are so young that they're pre language. I mean, you know, they're like two or three years old. They don't even know where they're from. Their parents are not there because their parents are dead in many cases, dead in the jungles and other people pick up the kids. This happens all the time. It's happening as we speak. So when the children come in, in the arms of somebody else, the other people either keep them as their own uh, or the, or they give them to the Panamanian authorities or sell them or whatever. And the Panamanian authorities, if, if they, if they, you know, if they take them, they'll end up, they'll try to find out where the child's from. But many times you can't tell because the kids can't even speak any language yet. And so mm -hmm. they and finally will eventually give them a, a, a Spanish name and send them to school. And they're now Panamanian. Uh, so, I mean, this is, there's just lost children out there and you see it all the time. This isn't something that you see now and then. If you go to Bajo Chiquito, I could take you, it would take us three days. We could be out there in three days. We could be in that jungle with people that are coming in, bleeding all over the place, no shoes because the mud sucks the shoes off their feet. 
Uh, they'll be telling you about bodies they stepped over and the friends they were with who got killed or lost mm. and never saw them again. Bodies coming down the river wrapped in tents and that sort of thing, because many of them do take small tents in. Uh, you know, it's a rainforest. They get hit with flash floods on that third mountain. Many of them fall off and die. There's a lot of people that, because it'll take you, if, if you're super Rambo fit in the weather and everything smiles on you and you do not get lost, he uh, it's going to take you about four days. That's if you're super fit, don't get lost. And many of them do get lost and that's it. Uh, mm. And, or they get lost and they're out for two or three weeks. Uh, and if everything is good and the, and the rivers are low, no serious flash floods, it'll take you four days. But most people you're talking about more than a week, right? And so, mm. but there's many people that'll be stuck out there right now as we speak. There's people stuck out in the jungle, like one guy, I call him 22 days. He was out there for 22 days. He messages me sometimes and, and, and they they can't go forward and they can't go back. And they're reliant on people, other migrants coming through to give them food or give them any help. They just die out there because nobody can carry them. And so there's, there's people stuck right now as we speak out in that jungle. And it's all because of hot human osmotic pressure, human osmotic pressure. When there's the push factor in the pull, the push factor is like leaving a war, but most of them are not leaving a war. The vast majority are going through, coming from, they might be from Haiti originally, but they've really been in Chile or Brazil for years. Okay. They're going through countries like Ecuador, where Americans go to retire. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so they're not, they're going through all these countries like Costa Rica, where people go to retire, Panama, where Chuck has gone to retire. You know what I mean? They're going through all these places where it's peaceful. Guatemala yeah, a lot of Guatemala is dangerous, but there's places where people go right now. Americans are on vacation, right? So, I mean, they're in, in Mexico is the same. And so it's not, about, it's not about them running from Godzilla. They're running to free stuff. And who blames them? I mean, they're doing what I mean, my, my great, great, great grandparents came they're, in 1609. They're, 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 they're incentivized. Reason. They're doing. So what you're saying is they're doing what they're incentivized to do. And kind of go yeah. through what you believe. It's not their fault. The, the what? Yeah, could you, could you go through what you believe those incentives are? You'd mentioned well, they, a few things, but. Well, I mean, they believe they're going to get free money. I mean, they believe that they're going to, and they are. I mean, they believe that they'll be able to instantly, uh, uh, you know, get driver's licenses and that sort of thing and uh, get jobs and, and, and in many cases get on the dole. I mean, getting taxpayer money, which they are. And so, and right now, as you know, many Americans are right now, I'm seeing traffic come in where, you know, we have people, uh, you know, like Southwest Airlines canceled 27% of flights Sunday, apparently. I mean, we, we, our, our economy is now shutting off the lights and China's doing the same. I spent a lot oh, of yeah, time China in China. Oh yeah, going through yeah. steep, uh, an energy crisis right now where they're forced to decide, do we send the electricity to homes or do we send it to businesses? And Right now, I mean, Apple's operations, their Foxconn operations have been shut down for a couple of days. You know, they're intermittent. Yeah. In fact, I ordered some Apple products because of I, I wish I didn't have Apple products, but I'm still using them. And and I, in fact, they've been very, very slow coming, very slow. And I need a new camera as well, which is not Apple, but uh, Sony camera and you can't get the camera. Sony mm -hmm. Alpha, Alpha One, Sony Alpha One. I haven't seen it out there for for. But well, I mean, you can see it for sale, but you can't get it. Too. We're seeing yeah. energy yeah. shocks in Europe. Yeah. Um, so all over Asia uh, and winter's coming. Uh, we're fortunate, you know, right now we're fortunate here in the States where it's where it, things are mild, but they're cold in Europe and they're wet and rainy in China right now. So what's going to happen in Europe? You were in shape, right? I mean, you were so you got to feel I spent six years in Europe myself. What's mm -hmm. going to happen? Energy prices and energy availability oh. in Europe is in question at this point. What's Absolutely. going to happen? What's going to so, happen? Well, they, they bet wrong. Unfortunately, they bet wrong on um, on things like solar and wind. And they decommit. They they got off the coal and uh, now they're reliant on natural gas. And those stocks are down. And it's not like you can just order this stuff up. Uh, even, you know, they're, they're going to be more reliant on the Russians going forward. They have no choice in the matter. They need the energy. Um, they bet with their bleeding hearts and now they're about to pay for it with their bleeding souls. 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's, they, they have totally been brainwashed to do silly things. Uh, you know, I get, I spent six years in Europe. I speak German fluently. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've seen what's happened to them. They've slowly been emasculated and not, not Eastern Europe, not the Poles. I lived there for two years. They've still got, you know, real serious people there. Right. And same with Czech. I was just in Lithuania. Same thing. Actually, still stand I up. was in Poland and Lithuania in 2014. Yeah, it's uh, they're yeah. a bit different, the, but unfortunately, yeah, those two countries, you know, they they're, they're pro West, but they're very pro U.S. Unfortunately, they're right next to the Russian bear, and that's a that's a yeah. reality, you know. That's yes, that's... Lithuania in particular is really just a nibble away. Um, you know, yeah. uh, I was really. Uh, uh, concern this year at Zapad between Belarus and Russia, the military exercises that they might mm. nibble off part of, especially mm. Lithuania or maybe Estonia, wow. or, or yeah, but uh, but they they didn't. But I mean, but but Belarus has been pushing migrants in there, which is why Chuck Holt and I went there. We were down in uh, in Morocco, and Chuck called uh, Warsaw and uh, called the headquarters of their uh, their border patrol, the European Border Patrol. Uh, Oh, good, Nora. Sorry, I've forgotten their name. They're essentially worthless anyway. There's about 1,500 of them, which what who, 1,500 who are, people. Who are the migrants that are being, that are moving into Eastern Europe that, from what you've been able to see? And where are they? Uh, I, I interviewed a lot of them. I got a lot of them on video. Uh, many were Iraqis. Uh, some are Afghans, not very many. Uh, six Chechens that I got on video. Mm. And actually a couple of them spoke German fluently and another spoke English, actually. They have to keep the Chechens separate. You know, the critical mass for Chechens, they say, is six. Once you get more than six Chechens, they reach criticality and go go Chechen, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, you know fight and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So they kept the Chechens separate, actually, and um, and um, and so many were mostly Iraqis, many from uh, uh, some from Syria, but also many from Kenya, uh, Congo. Uh, Nigeria. So there was a lot of Africans as well. And they didn't have any idea that they had just been weaponized because when I was talking with them, you could tell like the Africans and, and the Iraqis are like, why are we free to go? We didn't realize that this was part of an international fight. We just were told in Africa and Iraq that we could just fly to Turkey or whatever and then go straight to Minsk and then just go to Lithuania. And so, or, you know, go to Europe, they're told right. they can go to Europe. And so the next thing you know, they're being pushed across the border into Lithuania or Poland, Poland pushed them right back. And, and the Lithuanians have started pushing them back. To, in fact, I advised them to do that. They were asking me what would I, I was with the Lithuanians in Afghanistan. So when I showed up, they already knew who I was. And I went straight to meet the, the uh, vice deputy foreign minister with Chuck Colton. And I mean, within eight hours, we were sitting in his office. So we were getting keys that most people don't immediately get because I was off with them in the war but but mm-hmm. and so you know I was out with their military and their police and their uh, intelligence guys and so for about three weeks I got to really see what was going on and uh, the migrants you know I felt bad for them and, and the Lithuanians do too the Lithuanians are like these poor people they don't have any idea that we're not letting them go to Poland because Poland's going to shoot you know if you look at the map Lithuania, you know how it is. I mean, yeah. you can't. It was, it's not it like you can the, just. It was the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth at one time. That's right, and and many Lithuanians speak Polish, mm-hmm. and as you know, and 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 of course, uh, you can't just leap from Lithuania over to Germany. <laughs> There's a big Poland in between, and Poland mm-hmm. doesn't want you, you know, and um and and so uh, that put Lithuania in a spot. You know how that started with Belarus? Is that you remember that mm-hmm. aircraft that was brought down earlier? Uh, earlier this year, right. it was the, the, the MiG was uh, scrambled because some blogger or something had been saying things that, the, that Lukashenko, who's the, the dictator of, of, uh, of, uh, of Belarus, didn't like. And so they sent up a MiG, did a fake bomb scare and made the aircraft land in Minsk, arrested the guy and I think another person. And then the EU and Lithuania is like, hey, you can't do that. That's dictator stuff. And Lukashenko, the dictator, said, I'm not a dictator. And they're like, yes, you stole the election. <coughs> and, was a, and so, uh, yeah. And so, there, and he's like, I didn't steal the election. And here, for your troubles, I'm going to start pumping migrants, drugs, and radioactive material into the EU through Lithuania and Poland. And so that's how it started. 
Now, keep in mind, Chuck and I, Chuck Holton and I were just down in, in Morocco as well. And, you know, I don't want to say bad things about Morocco because they were the first country to recognize the United States back in, when was that, 1778 or seven? It was a long time ago. So they're the first country to recognize us. And we've been good partners ever since. So I'm very reluctant to, you know, they've helped us on many things and we help them and we get along great. I love Morocco. And, 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 you know, and how, how present, we settle the, after we settled issues with the Barbary pirates, they were, they could be, ah, we had to take care of that. But at the end of the day, I mean, like when I was in uh, Casablanca, what the people, the people are like, Oh, you're American. Oh, hello, America. They're still doing that. Right. And mm -hmm. so, and, uh, and, uh, and I just really like the, the uh, Moroccans, I always have. And so now, but let's be honest, <laughs> they are weaponizing migrants against EU and Spain. And, and the reason they're doing it, for instance, you know, there's that Polisario secessionist movement, which is directly linked to Al Qaeda yeah. in, 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 in the Western Sahara, south of Morocco, right? And mm -hmm. and, 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 and Spain let some of the Al Qaeda related people land in Spain and 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 uh, and 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 Morocco said send them back, and, and Spain said no, we're going to keep them. And EU said nope, we're going to keep them. And so Morocco said, really? Here, have nine thousand migrants. And wow. because you know, there's two there's two Spanish cities in in Morocco, which is in Africa, uh, mm -hmm. called Ceuta and Melilla. Right? They're actually EU cities, European Union cities in Africa. Right? Oh. Uh, if you look at them, and yeah, and so. So we flew down there, Chuck and I flew down there from Greece because uh, we were watching the weaponization from Turkey that Turkey's doing it. And so, uh, and so we, we went down to Morocco and went to Ceuta only on the border, they got a wall there. And so there's about 80,000 Spanish uh, that live in Ceuta, which is on the coast there at Morocco. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, many uh, Moroccans and others are like, hey, you're a European city, why are you in Africa? You know, and of course, they've got that argument going on and others are like, you're not even African, you're Moroccan, whatever, you know, what? it's a local fight. But the bottom line is, oh, President Trump, yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let, let them keep that going. I'll stay out of that one. But, you know, we got enough fights on our plate and I like Morocco. You know, and, but, but President Trump, he made a lot of shrewd and wise decisions. For instance, he sided with Morocco, our old time friend. They have been a great ally through thick and thin, Barbary Coast thing, a little blip in the road. But, you know, but they, they work with us on a lot of stuff and we work with them and you're very welcome there as an American. And President Trump sided with Morocco against the Polisario terrorist mm -hmm. group that's related to uh, Al Qaeda. In Spain, being Spain, they, you know, no, 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 talking bad about Spain, but we'll probably fight them again someday, and, you know, and, 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 you know, they're allowing these guys to come in. And so we have, we continue to have good relations with Morocco, but Morocco, you know, they're like, here, we're going to, we're going to pry the door open with some migrants because you got all these Algerians and others who want to get into uh, EU. And if they can get to Ceuta, if you look where it is on the map, if you look on, uh, uh, if you, um, on the Northern, you know, where Morocco is and, uh, but Ceuta is right on the Mediterranean. Right. And so is Melilla. And if you look in the news, you'll see Ceuta and Melilla in the news, like about once a week with more migrants coming through. And so when Spain acts up and, you know, starts jabber jaw into Morocco, Morocco just opens the floodgates, you know? And, uh, so you got a bunch of migrants out there from places like Algeria, uh, that are just camped like coochie dogs out in the mountain, out on the hills right there in the rocks. Mm -hmm. You know how coochie dogs are big holes and stuff? They, that's We're out there with them. They're like, wow, they, they live out here like literally coochie dogs waiting for Morocco. I'm talking about Algerians and whatnot, waiting for, uh, you know, Morocco to to say, okay, go, go at them again. There's Suta. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, yeah, and it's a, it's got 80,000 people. And then when they earlier this year breached the wall and swam around and all this stuff and the the some of the people from Suta were like terrified they're like seeing these guys from you know parts unknown all over Africa and Algeria and everything breaking into Suta and it's a walled city there you know uh, and and they're way outnumbered they don't have guns and you know it was like bar the doors you know and, and guard your women you can see them on the videos some of the guys from Africa are like doing the ah, you know and, you know and the Spanish, I mean, it's a very uh, serious experience for them. And so, so you see this weaponization of migration. We also were just in Greece. Turkey's done the same thing, of course, to the EU and Greece. And, and, 
EU collectively in Greece specifically. And when Chuck and I were out at a, at a small restaurant in, uh, in Greece, I said, Hey, let's, I was like, there's a small restaurant in this village and it's near a wall with Turkey. Mm -hmm. I said, let's go to this small restaurant and I'll guarantee you militia guys will come out here and check us out and see where we are. We'll, we'll be able to get a conversation. With so we, cause you know, I, I do this all over the world, you know what I mean? And so I, I can, to me, this is like gator hunting. I can find a gator. I'm from Florida. You know, I used to catch them and I can find, I, I can find the militia. I know how to do it. And so we're in, we're in Greece and we go to this small restaurant, man, it was about 15 minutes. The restaurant filled up with these big dudes, you know, Greek guys. And they're like, where are you from? You know? And we're like, oh, you must be the militia. They're like, yes. You know, they start talking, start showing us photos of their radios. They got guns and everything. They're like, they're building, you know, they're like the EU is building that wall, not to protect the migrant, us from the migrants, but to protect the migrants from us. I was like, hey, man, you guys, yeah, we need more American. We need more Americans like you. They're like, yes, because, you know, when the migrants went to Lesbos, the island, they're like, they're cutting down 300 year old olive trees, you know, to, for firewood. Well, again, you know, it's, it's, it's to be expected. I mean, as you just mentioned, these are people in very desperate straits. They're just thinking right. about how to fill their bellies for the next 24 hours. So you put them into a place that's functioning and you overwhelm it very quickly. That's right. Weaponized. And they're just innocent people. They're doing what we would do. I mean, if you, if you say, Hey, I can go to Canada and you're going to give me a huge amount of money and free stuff and dreams. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to Canada. And the Canadians would be like, well, you can come here. And I'm like, yes, we can watch, you know, and mm -hmm. because, you know, and then, and you'll, you'll do it. And because that's mm -hmm. the way the tides of humanity goes, you know, and that's the way it's being done against us now. Uh, Migrants are being weaponized, and uh, and 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 they're flooding the United States. And this is a this is this and other things are putting the United States into civil war. We're clearly what going to go you, into civil war. What do you 